Okay, so uh, this is actually my second take of this video, uh, and because the first one just sucked. Uh, and this is also one where, you know, I'm holding up my phone as a camera and standing against the wall like this because uh, I didn't bring a really good camera here and I can't find any much better place to uh, shoot anything to get a good shot of anything. So anyway, what I wanted to talk about here was I recently saw a rendition of the movie Miracle on 34th Street. Uh, now, there will obviously be spoilers here, so if, uh, if you haven't seen it and you uh, don't want me to ruin it for you, I suggest that you pause the video and go watch it right now. Like, right now. Okay, that's it. You don't get any more time. Um, so anyway, the sort of synopsis of that movie is that we've got a guy called Chris Kringle, who the movie essentially portrays as Santa Claus. And uh, actually, Chris Kringle is sort of the, I think, German term for Santa Claus. But, you know, the movie... In the context of the movie, he basically is Santa Claus, and he actually gets a job at Macy's where he's like the sort of pretend Santa that you see there. And what ends up happening is that he meets one of the managers at Macy's, whose name is Doris Walker, who is sort of like an unbeliever in Santa Claus. Uh, sort of like an atheist of Santa Claus, if atheism even applied there. I guess skeptic would be the better term. Uh, so, uh, Doris Walker is a skeptic of Santa Claus, and you probably see where this is going. She eventually, and her daughter too, but we'll get to that, uh, have an epiphany where... Uh, where they eventually come to believe that Chris is, in fact, Santa Claus. Uh, but anyway, back to the story. Uh, because Chris claims to be Santa Claus, he's eventually committed, committed to a mental institution, essentially. And what, we, and what happens is it goes to court. And when it goes to court, we've got one... We've got the defense lawyer for him saying that no Chris is actually not crazy when he claims to be Santa Claus because he as a matter of fact is Santa Claus and that's basically his case he uh, proves to the world that Chris is in fact Santa Claus and Santa is uncommitted and you know everyone lives happily ever after I guess uh, now to be honest I found that the movie rather boring uh, and uninteresting but one thing that I did think was interesting was that there was kind of a relation between that movie and skepticism. For one thing, Doris Walker has a child who I think is, I figure for about five years old or so, named Susan. And Doris is sort of raising Susan to not believe in fairy tales like Santa Claus. Uh... So, basically, there's sort of a stereotype there that, you know, atheists and skeptics want to shield children from these claims, right? Uh, at least, that's a stereotype that I've encountered in my discussions with, with people. Uh, and, of course, that's simply not true. Even within the context of Santa Claus... Um, there's nothing wrong with telling someone about Santa Claus and that people believe uh, Santa Claus. And there's no harm in having fun with telling stories, even if you don't believe that they're true. Uh, which Doris is not only... Not only is Doris like not tell, telling Susan that Santa Claus is real, which I think is a good thing, uh, but she's also trying to shield Susan from you know, these stories, almost. And that's something that I don't think any skeptic advocates. And it's not something that I think very many, if any, atheists advocate with regard to religions either. Uh, which is one of the parallels I'm drawing between this Santa Claus thing and religion. 
and by the way, I don't have children, but if I did, I would see these kinds of things as a great learning opportunity as a way of teaching my children how to go about determining which claims are true and which ones are not by using things like Christianity and Santa as an example. Um, so yeah, I think there's great value in, you know, at least giving them these stories. Uh, you definitely shouldn't tell them that they're true because that might make things worse. But what you should do, absolutely, is give them the story and teach them, use the opportunity to teach them how to distinguish reality from fantasy. You know, how do we know that Santa Claus and Jesus uh, do not have the ability, have the superpowers that they do? Um, and then there was... There was a scene in the movie that really struck me as odd. It was where, you know, uh, Doris is a divorced mother, essentially. And she sort of falls in love with the defense attorney, Fred. And Fred believes in Santa Claus and believes that Chris is Santa Claus. Uh, remember, that's how, what his defense of Chris was. Uh, and what Fred says is essentially... Uh, faith is believing what common sense tells you not to believe. And, you know, you have, you have to have, you know, joy and happiness in your life. So there's two claims in there. First of all, faith is believing what common sense tells you not to believe. I would say common sense and reason, especially. Reason and evidence uh, tell you not to believe. Um which, you know, is something that I would agree with, but, and then there's not really any reason to take anything on faith. You know, that's by definition. There's not any reason to do something which is unreasonable. But also, you know, there's that stereotype again, you know, which is that skeptics don't believe in joy and happiness because, you know, there's no evidence in favor of joy and happiness and blah, blah, blah. Um which is a stereotype, but it's kind of a baseless one. I mean, you can be a skept perfectly consistent skeptic and believe in joy and happiness and all that and enjoy things, so I don't know what uh, is going on there. And, and then in the trial, Fred, uh, one of the arguments that Fred makes is that, uh, you know, you can't prove that there is no Santa, because they're at that point they're trying to establish whether Santa exists. Period, and he says you can't prove there isn't a Santa. Well, you know that's a shifting of the burden of proof, uh, which is weird because after the uh, prosecutor puts the burden of proof back on Fred where it belongs, Fred immediately goes to provide evidence. So I don't know what that's. Why would you even try to shift the burden of proof if you have evidence? That just seems to me like a completely, you know, useless tactic. It's a waste of time. Um, oh, and by the way, the actual evidence that convinces everybody, and this might actually be somewhat convincing, was, you know, Fred said, do you think that the post office is, uh, you know, at least somewhat accurate in delivering mail? And everyone said yes. And he said, well, if you take a look here, every single letter that, uh, that the post office gets that's mailed to Santa is sent to this guy. And so that convinces everybody. Which, you know, is, I guess, fairly convincing, I suppose. Um, although, uh, although, you know, the claim that someone is Santa is an extraordinary claim, and I'm not sure that the evidence is quite extraordinary enough, but... Uh, you know, let's go with it. And then, uh, when Susan is asking Chris slash Santa what, uh, uh, whether he's Santa or not, and he keeps saying yes, you know, she wants evidence of this, and she wants, as this evidence, she wants Chris to give her and her mother, you know, this new house, uh, because right now they're sort of living in this apartment thing, and so she wants to live in this nice house. Um, and, you know, 
Santa says, well, you know, you can't just not believe in Santa because, uh, just because Santa can't give it to you. Now, in the story, Chris does eventually manage to get them the house, but the point here is that, you know, there's an obvious parallel here to God answering prayers, and while it's certainly not a valid argument to say that God doesn't answer prayers or Santa doesn't give you this present, therefore Santa or God doesn't exist, at the same time, uh, it's considered evidence against. It's one of those cases where you would expect to see evidence but don't, and therefore the absence of evidence does indeed constitute evidence of absence. But that's going to be another video. Um, needless to say, uh, a lot of people will give excuses for that, like the one that Chris gave, or uh, they'll give excuses like, you know, God is not a vending machine, or or God answers prayers with yes, no, or yes, or not yet. That's, that's one of my favorite ones. Uh, and so they essentially make their position unfalsifiable, right? Uh, which is fine, I guess, but they wouldn't be doing that if they had evidence. I mean, can you imagine if a study had shown that prayer worked? I mean, that would have been huge, and Christians would be using that as an argument. But when the evidence doesn't come out the way they want to, they sort of backpedal into unfalsifiability, which is a complete double standard. I mean, if if the if prayer would be evidence of God if it worked, then if it doesn't work, it should logically count as evidence against God. But it's a pretty clear double standard. Uh, anyway, I've been rambling about this uh, somewhat pointless topic to, uh, for 12 minutes now. And so uh, I'm just going to leave it here. Uh Hopefully I'll be making more videos, more better videos than this in the near future. Um, but for now, that's it. See ya.